questions? Got it. All good. All good. Okay. All right, so we do want to get um, started on this webinar tonight. So glad that uh, see everybody here. Well, not see, but to um, see everybody say hi in the chat. But before we be we begin, we just want to take a, a moment to just pause and have a moment of silence. Um, there were a few people uh, that wanted to be here tonight. But this webinar happens to be right at the same time as the sacred fire ceremonies in Kamloops to remember the 215 children that were found at the residential school. And so we wanted to start off this webinar just to coincide with them starting right at six o'clock to take a moment of silence just to, I think the least that we can do is to remember um, the children that never came home and also their families and their communities um, that also were affected. And so what I'm gonna do is <clears throat> just, um, I'm gonna put us on mute shortly and I'm gonna just time us for about a minute and um, I encourage you just in your own home to do what makes sense for you uh, before, we, before we dive in. So we'll just take this time and I'm just going to um, close the chat and just for the next minute just have a moment of, of silence just to remember before we begin. Right. Thanks. So I will. Oh, there you are. Hello. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, just so everybody knows, this is a webinar format. I know there's a few new people here. So we can't, nobody can see you. In with your video, but you should be able to be able to see a screen that says pain sense on it. And, um, and you might be able to see my video and then Mark Lawrence and his video. And if you can't just scroll around to where you might find a little box that says view, click on that and see if you can't get um, if you want to uh, have a view of us. And uh, all good. Okay, great. So this is um, a pain education night, and I encourage you, I'll turn it to, to uh, I'm Madeline Means, and, and I'm here with Dr. Mark Lawrence from the Bill Nelms Pain and Research Center. And I encourage you to just sit back and take in some of this information that um, we're gonna be talking about over the next hour, because you will hear this information woven into probably all of our other webinars. But once in a while, we do one that's just uh, around the, ed the uh, information around chronic pain and why pain persists. So don't feel like you need to take it all in because sometimes it's a lot to kind of understand. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I encourage you just sit, to sit back and, and take what makes sense for you right now in your life. So I'll turn it to you, Mark, if you want to say oh. some words before we get going. Yep, you can hear me okay. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I just want to welcome all the attendees uh, just on behalf of the Bourne Elms Pain and Research Centre to this evening's presentation. And as you said, um, tonight we want to sort of talk about what happens in chronic pain, what the difference between acute pain is and chronic pain. Because from, from our research, what we do know is if people have a better understanding of chronic pain, and I can only say for myself, you know, it's taken years and I, I think, you know, it's maybe in the, in the last 10 or 15 years that, you know, that we've been practicing pain management um, that I really understood the difference. I, I worked for 20 years as an anesthesiologist and, you know, we deal with acute pain and sometimes chronic pain. And I didn't really understand what chronic pain was until I really got interested in it. And at the same time, there's a lot more research coming out. So I think we have a better handle on how the nervous system changes and things that happen. And we know that if patients have a better understanding, it has better outcomes for their own management because it's one of the keys uh, building blocks of of chronic pain management is actually understanding or having a better understanding of what's going on amongst all Mm -hmm. the other things we, we will just briefly touch on tonight. And then I just want to say again, my usual thing about confidentiality that's uh, sort of mandated by the college that this is looked at as a group medical visit. Please feel free to make your comments and I would ask that we all just respect one another's confidentiality. Um, as people might want to disclose things that, you know, are of a personal nature or share. So yep. I think just be respectful and it'd be great. Thanks. So great. Yes. Yeah, so if you have in your in your journey with um with pain if you have felt like that you're alone or it's confusing um or why me or sometimes like you're banging your head against the wall you look for the next solution um or you look for the next thing that's going to heal your chronic pain you're not alone and you know that when you go to the doctor and you have say a broken arm you can even see it on the x-ray and usually you're given a good explanation of what's going on in your body. And in in my experience, this has not been true of chronic pain until recent years. So it's, as Mark said, it's really crucial that we have an understanding of what's going on in our body. Because you can imagine if your arm was broken, you didn't know, you you would really be afraid of what was happening in, in your arm. So the same goes with chronic pain. And I really hope over the next, this next hour, you get a good understanding of why pain persists long after you think, you know, this this shouldn't be here anymore. So let's, um, let's jump in. So as, as Mark said, like why pain education? Why spend the time a whole hour, hour and a half talking about pain education? It has been a very well researched part of treatment of chronic pain. In other words, you know, the medicine that you might get going to the clinic, you could see this kind of education or knowledge or information as also being like a, a type of medicine. And in fact, it's one of the foundational blocks Uh, of foundational, um, uh, well, I guess blocks or or steps, just like this guy right here um, in in your healing path. So it's not just an additional thing. It really is important to understand because then the interventions that you use will make more sense. And every journey starts with a single step. And this one will do for now. Okay. Did you want to talk to this one, Mark? Yeah, I think, um, again, if you look at the top left where it says knowledge about pain, it, you know, we, we often, what we like to, to refer to as a sort of the pain toolbox, which are the various interventions, education, procedures, et cetera, that we, uh, we present uh, as part of our webinars. So this one's about knowledge about pain. Uh, we have other, um, we have had many other webinars and I recognize some of the people that have attended. Uh, you know, we talk about optimizing sleep, 
Uh, we have a specific program on that with a, a sleep specialist, lifestyle changes and exercise. Uh, uh, you know, we, we have a physiotherapist who comes on and presents that. Um, you do a very good mindfulness-based um, webinar. Um, so these are some of the, the many things, each of them being really important um, in helping patients get a better understanding and therefore better management of their chronic pain. And the reason that we look at all these different things is we want to talk about how they affect the nervous system, which is, a, and that's why we, we're doing tonight's presentation is because once you understand, or once you have a better understanding of the changes that happen within your central nervous system, you'll see why these things are important because chronic pain, uh, it lives in the central nervous system a lot of the time. And so mm -hmm. good sleep, uh, you know, mindfulness-based therapy, which has got very good evidence for it behind it. There are changes that these interventions can affect on your, on your central nervous system in a, in a positive way to help undo some of the, the chronic pain messaging that's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So this is uh, one, one of the tools. Correct. So yeah. the pain knowledge or education actually is part of pain management. Um, like, like Mark was saying, it is one of the tools in the toolbox. And once you have that education or that knowledge, it does give you more uh, power and more say in um, how your own um, treatment goes. And you'll understand a little bit more about why we do the webinars that we do. We don't just do them for fun. <laughs> no. So, um, yeah. yeah. So acute, first we're going to talk. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, like this one on acute versus chronic pain. You know, again, mm -hmm. like there is, there is a huge difference. And it's only probably in the last maybe 10, 15 years that we've started to appreciate more and more that these are two completely different animals that we're dealing with here. Acute versus chronic pain not all pain is the same. You know, we used to think, oh, it's pain, right? It's not. It's mm -hmm. very, very different. So, okay. That's right. Yeah. So the purpose of pain, and uh, maybe I'll go a little bit through acute pain, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so acute pain, it has evolved, it, well, is an alarm that's here to protect you, to alert you that something's wrong so that you can heal. For example, if I, um, if I cut my hand, I need an alarm to tell me there's something going on so that I can go and run and get a Band-Aid or I can elevate my arm. So it, it's an alarm that we need in our bodies in order to keep us out of harm's way as best as, as we can. Um, and we would not have survived unless we had this alarm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so we need acute pain to tell us when we're in danger in, in order for us to be able to survive, you know, to get treatment and to heal. Yeah, so acute pain has a purpose. And I always like this picture of uh, the baby with the hot stove because he's got, a, this doesn't look like, I'm sure it's not on right now. But you can bet that as soon as he touches a hot stove, he's going to get that pain signal that Mark's going to tell us about in a bit that goes up his spinal cord into his brain and says, don't, you know, get away from that stove right away. And he'll probably run away crying and get some help simply because of that pain signal. And he'll probably, my guess is he'll probably never touch it again because mm -hmm. he knows that that is dangerous. And in fact, he might walk into the kitchen and just the sight of the stove might be enough to also um, definitely alert him and um, send off an, a signal of danger. Mm -hmm. So we, we definitely need that. Yeah. Did you want to talk to this one? Um, yeah, I mean, again, it just, this is acute pain, and then we'll move on to chronic pain. But what this does is, it, it's a protection mechanism, right? Acute pain is there to protect you. Imagine if you put your hand on a hot surface, or you put, you were in, you know, you're in danger, your the acute pain signal tells you to get, pull your hand away, remove yourself from the situation. 
you know, whether it's a, t a thermal uh, thing or you prick yourself or something, you pull your hand away. It's a protective mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Same as this guy has got a sprained ankle. He's right. going to, he's probably not going to be, keep walking no, is my guess. Is, and this is acute pain. So that's why we want everybody to understand. And then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's going to go get some help. Mm -hmm. So again, acute pain is like a harm alarm. And you might've heard us talk about this. So you've done empowered relief. Um, we talk about it being a harm alarm, alerting you to potential or real danger. So um, it's, it's this mechanism inside ourselves that, uh, thank goodness, that we have it, that tells us when, when there's harm or potential harm around. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I guess I'll talk to this one because a little mm -hmm. bit of physiology here. So basically, um, where your cursor was mm -hmm. over there, um, mm -hmm. the pain stimulus from something like your finger or your foot gets transmitted along the nerves, goes into your spinal cord, which is that little cross section. Whoopsie. And from your spinal cord, it goes up into your brain. And your brain is a supercomputer and it figures out instantaneously almost how you should react to that and sends a message down the green pathway, the descending pathway. And usually if it's something very noxious, like a, a, a burn or a poke or a cut, you react appropriately. So that's, in a nutshell, the, the message goes from the periphery, like your finger or your toe, up your leg or your arm into your spinal cord, shoots it up to your brain that computes things and tells you what to do real quick. Mm -hmm. And all that is probably done within less than a nanosecond. Correct, okay. it's very fast, the pain, the, the, the pain pathways, some of them are incredibly fast. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. And you can see where you work. We are going to get more into this, but there's a lot of factors that go into the brain making that decision, such as cognitive thoughts and emotional processes mm -hmm. that um, also get factored in there. Very, very good. Very quickly. Right. So what, what actually happens uh, like Mark said, when you have pain. So danger mon these danger messages are modified in the spinal cord, as he said, and travel up to the brain. And then the brain decides how dangerous is this and sends a message back down to increase or decrease pain protection. Right. But other messages can also increase or decrease the intensity of danger messages that go up and down the pain pathway. Right. So there's other factors as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are these other factors that can possibly affect pain? And you might even pay attention to these because these are also if they can increase pain, they might be able to decrease pain as well. So do you want to well, run through these or? Yeah, okay. so, so pain, if you look at the original definition, well, one of the better definitions now, it's, um, it's not only a physical, it's an emotional experience as well. We look at the International Association for the Study of Pain. It's an actual or perceived uh, emotional or sensory experience. In other words, and that's really important. There is a strong emotional component. So looking at how you experience pain, some of the things that might influence you, for example, a woman in childbirth, it's a very painful experience, but it doesn't have the same negative connotations, for example, as when you sprain your ankle, because generally speaking, childbirth is associated with giving birth and bringing another human being into into the world. So, you know, people, women will often talk about their childbirthing experiences. Yes, it's painful, but the, there's a lot of joy associated with bringing a child into the world. Whereas when you sprain your ankle, it's like, it just hurts and it's like unnecessary. It is a different context. And these things influence how we experience different types of pain. Also like visual cues, like we actually had a, 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 a tutorial about this today. For example, uh, if you see something that's traumatic, like, you know, blood or a broken bone, your experience of that pain is often um, way more 
intense you know we, we think about that even in the procedure room that we do like you know one of the clues today that we spoke about is you know if patients come in for procedures they probably shouldn't be looking at the needles and how we draw things up because it just heightens their you know it heightens your anxiety so lots of things like making it a calm environment feeling at ease um you know because when we put a needle through the skin yeah it's uncomfortable but it can be way less uncomfortable if your nervous system is not ramped up so you know just just making it a calm pleasant or as pleasant as you can be environment where you feel safe decreases the pain experience mm -hmm. you know so yeah i always think of the example of this one if, if you ever have a child who falls down say in a playground picks themselves up and keeps going and then notices that there's a lot of blood on oh, yeah. their knee all of a sudden it becomes very painful yeah. and it maybe it wasn't a few minutes ago so yeah right. you're right what you can see what you're exposed to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. uh yeah do you want to do this one thoughts and emotions sure. this is also your what you say to yourself and uh this is part of other webinars that we do as well um empowered relief so um what you're saying to yourself about it and um, also, if you have a memory of something having, having um, happened like that before, that maybe was um, very traumatic or really hurt a lot, when you have a, a similar experience, those previous memories are going to surface, likely. Mm -hmm. And also the emotions. I mean, does anybody here ever notice that um, when they feel stressed, that pain also increases as well. I'm curious if anybody has that experience of, of noticing. Yeah, most definitely sometimes, yeah. Yeah, so how is that, that when stress levels go up, pain levels also go up because mm -hmm. it's affected by emotions as well. Mm -hmm. So in fact, everything around us affects our perception of pain. Yeah, so if you think about pain and you think about the context, like Mark was saying, our thoughts, our feelings, um, um, and our, our body, what else is going on in our body, all of these things have an influence on our experience of pain. So, uh, yeah, so context. <clears throat> so, for example, here's a woman who, I, I'm, oh. yeah, now I'm glad I sprained my ankle. The view from up here is beautiful. Now, she may not be having that wonderful experience of a sprained ankle if she was by herself and now realized that she has to get five kilometers into a hospital. The injury is the same. The pain experience can still be different. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, what, so what does all this mean? So of all these things affect pain. All this means is that if these all these factors affect pain, it gives us many doorways to influence our pain other than medications and surgery, which are all important as well. But remember that no matter your experience of pain and whether um, you know it's a smaller injury or a bigger injury, more pain, less pain, all pain is real, no matter what the cause is. No matter if it increases with stress, it's still real. It's still real pain. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think Go this. Ahead. Oh, you're on mute. I think you just got muted. That happens a lot to me. <laughs> I think this is a good example of not all pain necessarily means it's dangerous just a, an example we all know how painful a, a, like an ice cream headache is but it's not going to cause you any any real harm right it's just it's really uncomfortable uh, and this is the way your brain figures out oh okay this 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 will pass right as opposed to you know if you cut your finger and you're a guitar player well that's a whole different kettle of fish if you make your living using your fingers you, you know your perception of that pain is way more serious whereas this it hurts but you know that it's going to pass and it's not going to cause you any real mm -hmm. harm in the long run. Right. And even though it's, it, it doesn't mean you have any damage in your head, although the pain is in your head, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like how, 
how what a crazy kind of body is that yeah yeah right so that's the one with the paper cut as i said and they you know context specific if if you earned your living playing a guitar and you slice your finger that has some serious you know repercussions for you so emotionally financially etc whereas if you just cut your finger and you know put a band-aid on it's probably going to be fine tomorrow right yeah and and the amount of pain doesn't equal the um the size of the injury so yeah. a paper cut is a relatively small injury um and we can see what it is but there can be a massive amount of pain because there's so many nerve endings in that finger so the size of the, the cut doesn't necessarily equal the size of the pain. The other, the flip side of that is, so you've got tissue damage with a paper cut with a lot of pain, a little bit of tissue damage. A lot of tissue damage can also exist without pain, such as a silent heart attack. So you can also have something quite serious going on and have little or no pain. So it can go either way. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so the main message for all, all of this, no matter if it's, you, you can't tell me the paper cut isn't real pain, it's real pain. And um, no matter what, so here we have an example of, um, you know, perhaps someone who has had a limb amputated and we find with limb amputations that up to 80% of people still have pain coming from that limb that is no longer there. So um, how can that be? How can it be that there's no longer a limb there, yet there's pain in the limb? Which leads us to the conclusion that you need to have a brain in order to have pain but you don't actually need to have a limb in order to have pain, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I think that's, that's where we're gonna move on. And this short video is really helpful in understanding concepts around chronic pain. So yeah, if you wanna play it and then we can really get into the mm -hmm. chronic changes that occur. Sure, perfect. So this is about a, this is a five minute video that's uh, really informative, and then we're going to dive right into um, chronic pain and why pain persists. So hopefully, you can let me know if you hear this. Here we go. I can't hear it now. Oh. Oh, okay. Are you not hearing it? Let's try that again. Let me know if everyone you can agrees that pain is a universal human experience. We now know that pain is 100% of the time produced by the brain. This includes all pain, no matter how it feels sharp, dull, strong, or mild and no matter how long you've had it. You might have had it for a few weeks or months. This is called acute pain, and it's common with tissue damage, say from a back injury or ankle sprain. And generally, you'll be encouraged to stay active and gradually get back to doing all your normal things, including work. Or you might have had it for three months or more, and this pain is generally called persistent or chronic, because in this type of pain, Tissue damage is not the main issue. What's less clear though, is when you're told you have chronic pain, is knowing what's best to do about it. Well, in Australia, chronic pain is a really big problem. In fact, one in five people have it. Having a brain that keeps on producing pain, even after the body tissues are restored and out of danger is no fun. Some people say it still feels like they must have something wrong. But that's just it. Once anything dangerous is ruled out, health professionals can explain that most things in the body are healed as well as they can be by three to six months. So ongoing pain being produced by the brain is less about structural changes in the body 
and more about the sensitivity of the nervous system. In other words, it's more complex. So to try and figure out what's going on, you need to retrain the brain and the nervous system. To do this, it's helpful to look at all the things that affect the nervous system and may be contributing to your individual pain experience. What can help is to look at persistent pain from a broad perspective, and by using a structured approach and a plan, it's less likely that anything important will be missed. Let's start with the medical side. Firstly, taking medication can help, but only to a limited extent. It is the more active approaches that are necessary to retrain the brain. So using medications to get going is okay, and then mostly they can be tapered and ceased. Some people also think surgery might be the answer, but when it comes to a complex problem like chronic pain, surgery may not be helpful. So if you're thinking of surgery, it's best to get a second opinion and remember to consider all the things. Next, it is helpful to consider how your thoughts and emotions are affecting your nervous system. Pain really impacts on people's lives and this can have a big effect on your mood and stress levels. All those thoughts and beliefs are brain impulses too, but you can learn ways to reduce stress and wind down the nervous system. This helps with emotional well-being and can reduce pain as well. The third area to consider is the role of diet and lifestyle. Now, it turns out that our modern lifestyle might not be so good for us. In fact, what we eat and how we live may really be contributing to a sensitized nervous system. Looking at all the things like smoking, nutrition, alcohol and activity levels and seeing if there are any issues is a good beginning. And these things can go on your plan. Then there's often enormous value in exploring the deeper meaning of pain and the surrounding personal story by stepping back and looking at all the things that were happening around the time the pain developed. Many people with pain can make useful links between a worrying period of life and a worsening pain picture. For many, recognizing deeper emotions can be part of the healing process. Last, but by no means least, is physical activity and function. From the brain's perspective, getting moving at comfortable levels without fear and where the brain does not protect by pain is best and you'll gradually restore your body's tissues. So to sum up pain, it comes from the brain and it can be retrained. And when looked at from a whole person or broad perspective, gives you a lot of opportunities to begin. So get a helping hand if you need it, set a goal and begin. Okay, so you can hear us. So there, there may have been a lot of questions that come up as a result of that video. Um, and uh, um, yeah, Mark, did you want to speak to the video at all? Uh, no, well, yeah, I just, I thought it's a really good brief summary of what happens. And it just emphasizes the, you know, some of the things that we do, they spoke about emotions, nutrition, habits, exercise because obviously there's a theme running here and that chronic pain is perceived in the brain. And so retraining the brain is really important. And that's what a lot of our presentations are about from different aspects. Um, mm -hmm. So again, hence this evening, trying to explain some of those changes, which we're gonna get into in more detail mm -hmm. now is I think very helpful for people to understand why it's so important. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so here we are at uh, what is chronic pain now? And I think what they said in the video was um, as it, we normally think of chronic pain, uh, of pain being chronic after three to six months. So similar to Australia, chronic pain affects one in five Canadians. That's 20%. That's quite a lot of people. So if your pain has persisted for more than three to six months, this is when it's called chronic or persistent pain. So what we're going to get into now is how this pain signal is a learned protective mechanism. 
And as you all know, it's, um, it's complex. It's also invisible and it can be very confusing, but it's very real. Even if we're saying it's coming from the brain, that does not in any way mean that it's all in your head. And some of you may have had that impression or been even told that before. And um, that's unfortunate because uh, it does originate in the brain and it makes it the end, it's very real. So pain is like a fingerprint. And everyone's experience and what will help their pain is going to be different. So it can never be a one size fits all. So there you go, Mark, there's your definition. Yeah, yeah. And, and also um, I think the other important part of that is that it's, it's a personal experience. Um, people's pain is not the same. It's, exp it's experienced differently by different, by everybody. It's it, that, that, thing about being a fingerprint it is you know no two people will necessarily experience the same painful stimulus the same way so it is a sensory and emotional experience so you know originally we just thought of pain in terms of sensations like heat cold burning pressure etc there is a we re now recognize that the emotional component is just as important and that's huge mm -hmm. okay right so um, in this slide, on the left at the bottom are, are the sort of um, receptors, whether it be touch, pressure, pain, that again, go into the spinal cord, go up the red line, go into your brain. Now the big green arrows, um, starting at the prefrontal cortex, the PFC, and then down the spinal cord, your, our brains and our nervous system, what we'd call the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, have ways of down-regulating pain signals. So in other words, when pain is no longer useful, in other words, say for example, you cut yourself or you burnt yourself and it's now two hours later and the burn is receding, it's not a severe burn. The down-regulating pathways have the ability to tell you like, you know what? I know it's still sore somewhat from the burn, but you're not on fire and you're not in danger. So those pain uh, signals should start diminishing. Unfortunately, patients who develop chronic pain, this is where things go wrong. That, mm -hmm. in, that inhibiting, down-regulating ability of our central nervous system, our brain and spinal cord is one of the primary things that is not working the way it should. And there are many factors that affect this, which we're going to start looking at. So that, okay. that endogenous or that, that of our own down-regulating pathway is not working like it should be. Right. So yeah. um, sometimes in chronic pain, there, it's referred to as central sensitization, which is where the central nervous system um, is, um, is perceiving pain and it, that's where it gets back to perceiving because it's an individual experience. Um, the stimulus is far greater than it is, right? In other words, mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll talk more about this. So some of the factors that can influence um, patients negatively in terms of how they might experience pain are like sometimes it's genetics uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, if your mother and father had chronic pain, you're going to get it. It's just, there is a link. Past experience, you know, stress, certain beliefs and attitudes, which are, you know, individual or, and based in, in society. Um, you know, um, there, are, there are several factors that go into this. So, yeah, I, I think it's important to realize that it's very individual how we perceive pain. And it doesn't mean that you're, you know, any that you'll have poorer coping skills that you're any you know less able to deal with pain because they are you know there are so many factors it doesn't mean that at all mm -hmm. so, right go ahead there yeah yeah so in chronic pain what happens is that the nerves in the central nervous system um, they stay excited or for example another way to think about it and we've got a diagram coming up is that, you know, if you have one equivalent of pain coming in, 
the nervous system doesn't put one equivalent out or less than it actually amplifies it mm -hmm. so that the pain actually for example like where light touch or a my or a mildly painful sensation is no longer perceived as light touch or mildly painful it's actually perceived as is excruciating or very uncomfortable. So your nervous system is actually ramping up these signals. It's increasing them. It's unable to downregulate them. Mm -hmm. So the central nervous system, as you say, has learned too well, uh, you know, how to uh, protect oneself, and it's become sensitized, so that uh, the output from the nervous system is actually increased, not decreased. Right. And even if there is no danger or anything, um, you know, a common example is someone who's a patient with fibromyalgia where, um, you know, I'll never forget one of my patients left the room and, and I just said, okay, goodbye. And I put my hand on their shoulder and just that light pressure is actually really uncomfortable for them. And, you know, that, that stuck in my mind. It's like, oh, right. You know, something that we would just say, okay, goodbye. Have a, you know, uh, just that pressure to them is just a light touch is really uncomfortable. And I think people with fibromyalgia know exactly what I'm talking about because they often don't like to be touched or hugged or because even just, you know, that, just that pressure is magnified. Yeah. So this is called central So what you're saying is like those, yeah, those nerves. So actually when you touch, when you talk about touching them on the shoulder, there's no damage there, no. but those nerves are still acutely aware and excited at, say excited like they're talking to each other that there's still danger and that that um um that excitement or talking to each other gets louder and louder when it should actually be turning off is that right, right? exactly yeah You're right exactly so that's why the, the nervous system is sensitized or or or, or wrapped up the way, it, the way it handles stimuli, which, um, you know, uh, there are specific terms for that where something that is, and, and there's, this is the great example that I was talking, I think you can understand um, mm -hmm. in, in a normal situation with the three arrows going in and the three arrows coming out. In other words, That's three normal. arrows worth of pain stimulus equals Sorry. three out, right? Whereas right. when it gets modulated, it gets up modulated or sensitized, three arrows in gives you five or six out you know, um, mm -hmm. and then even at the bottom with no pain, just one arrow in like light touch is perceived as pain. And that is, there are, there are specific terms for that. That particular situation is called allodynia, where even light touch is perceived as pain. Or mm -hmm. the one in the middle is called hyperalgesia, where, where a modestly painful stimulus is perceived as excruciatingly painful because your nervous system right. is so ramped up. Right. 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 So with even with no, like, as they say, no incoming pain signals on the bottom, you're still getting an output, like exactly. the output is yeah. still um, uh, very painful. So this is, this is it, like, it's really difficult for when someone's in pain to actually say, well, I've got all this pain, but I don't actually have any more damage in my body. Because no. it goes against what our not our, um, it's counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. To what our body's telling us this is the this is the the trick about chronic pain isn't it mm -hmm. and then and then you go to your doctor and there's nothing obvious and the doctor's like, like well i can't see anything wrong with you right so then mm -hmm. you don't probably feel believed and, mm -hmm. and and lots of physicians don't really understand chronic pain unless they have a specific interest in it uh, because quite frankly what gets taught in medical school uh, they did some comparisons and I, I think vets get better training in chronic pain than physicians. Oh. It's actually terrible to be quite honest. It was I hope a, that's changing. I hope that's changing I, I now. think it is. I think it is. But if yeah. you look at, uh, honestly, if, if you look at the amount of time that was devoted to chronic pain management in med school, it was almost zero. Mm. So, so um, yeah, this, this diagram okay. on the, on the left is a normal pain pathway. The, the blue, the blue pathway is light touch, which comes from the little paintbrush or the little brush, and then it's carried up your spinal cord. The red pathway mm -hmm. is the pain pathway. You know, you bang or you stab your toe. Now, what happens in chronic pain is that in the spinal cord level, there's a bit of a cross linkage that gets activated between the, the blue and the red pathway so that 
you don't actually need a pain stimulus anymore to experience pain. Even the light touch, like the stroking with the blue, uh, the little brush, because of that cross linkage is suddenly experienced as pain. And that's on a spinal cord level. And that is central right. sense. That's one of the causes of central sensitization is because the nerves, uh, the nerve receptors in the spinal cord are so upregulated that now even light touch or modest pain is mm-hmm. perceived as excruciating. Okay. So that's, yeah. that's, that's, uh, that's oh. part of central sensitization that can happen in the spinal cord level or the brain level. In this example, it's So I hope this is kind of making sense for people. There's a few different examples about how Mm -hmm. the nervous system gets ramped up. And so even long after the injury or the condition has healed, you can still have, like it can get, it can trigger a chronic pain um, phenomenon in that the pain is still talking, shouting to at you but the original source of the pain is is is, there's no further damage Mm -hmm. i guess yeah and i I see there was a comment there about being involved in a car accident and having you know serious injury but not developing chronic pain and then having another mm -hmm. minor relatively minor injury years later and developing chronic pain um that's Mm -hmm. not unusual because that goes to that past experience those 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 buried thoughts etc that have been and something else yeah. that's relatively minor uh, not to downplay what happened but you know of less severe injury and suddenly it trips that nervous system and it gets ramped up yeah, um, yeah and in fact we have a very one of the world famous pain um, mm-hmm. physiologists who's going to tell a story probably about his experience with that in a few weeks yeah. time and explain it anyway so to that person, there was, um, uh, if you, we had a webinar a couple of weeks back um, with Joe Belton and she had the same, she was a firefighter and had numerous injuries like, and surgeries growing up and healed in a normal recovery process. And then one day stepped off her truck the wrong way and started this triggered, uh, like Mark said, this whole cascade of chronic pain. Mm-hmm. Who knew that that was going to be that that was going to be the one thing that changed everything. We just can't explain it. Hey, why, why some people do and some people don't. So the thing to remember is that when pain persists, the pain is in the brain and the amount of pain depends on the brain's evaluation of how much danger you are in. And this is largely subconscious. So I think it's fair to say that I can be sitting here and know that I'm completely safe. I'm not in danger and, um, and still have a ramped up nervous system sending me pain signal signals. Um, Absolutely. Because the brain considers the wide range of information prior to sending the pain messages out. Like there's a lot, lot going on in there that, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that we, that we're not privy to. Right, exactly. And I think that, you know, like you say, it, it depends on how the brain, how each of our brains analyzes the unique situation. And that's why so many of the webinars we do focus on different aspects of modulating that. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know Paul had asked a question about can this change? And yes, there is a, it's called neuroplasticity. It's about changing the brain and how we perceive things. That's why we wanted to bring some of this information because through mm-hmm. um, through education, through breathing and relaxation techniques, through exercise in moderation, all of these things um, can change the brain in a positive way to downregulate what these negative impacts, these negative um, right. modulating system is doing to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're going to get to all those ways mm-hmm. um, how to downregulate that to remember that even though we're talking about the brain and the nervous system, that pain is still real, no matter what. So Mm -hmm. never think that because it's in my brain, I should have control over it. Clearly 20% of people have chronic pain. If we could have control over it, we wouldn't even be here tonight talking about it. Exactly, nobody wishes to be in chronic pain, you know, and Mm -mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
So when you're in pain, every system of your body changes when you need to be protected. If you can imagine being chased by a lion or a grizzly bear, every single system in your body is involved in protecting you and helping you to survive. And this is that fight, flight, freeze response that turns on um, when your brain decides to feel pain. And um, you've probably heard of the stress response. And if you haven't taken empowered relief, please take it this time around. Um, this, this is what we're talking about, the nervous system, the fight, flight, freeze response that turns on, that tells you you're in danger. So, or sorry, in response to being uh, in danger. Eventually your central nervous system learns, our brains learn really fast learns really well how to protect you even the, in the absence of an injury. So those pain pathways are still um, being traveled. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't answer any of these because I might get some wrong. That would be really embarrassing. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's do our little true and false. Um, and you can just answer in the chat if you want to or just to yourself. So number one, true or false? And uh, you've only had a, just a crash course in pain education, so, so don't worry. The degree of pain equals the degree of injury. True or false? I'm seeing a false. What is that called when you're false? False, false, false. Okay, good. Okay, you guys good. Are it. You guys are listening. Well done. That's a, uh, yeah, it's one to go back to. And if you can remember that when you're in pain, good job. Number two, pain can still exist even after an injury is healed. True or false? True, true, yeah, all true, true. good, yeah. good. Okay, good. Number three, but that means it's not real pain after three to six months. True or false? False. Oh, right. right. Chronic pain is real. We and I we don't need to tell you that. But um, don't ever think if somebody uh, you have that that you're exaggerating or making it up. Or some people even start to doubt themselves. They think, is this mm -hmm. really real? Is this real? What I'm feeling? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. If you're feeling it, nobody makes this stuff up. Mm -hmm. Nobody would. Right. Okay. Number four. Cho chronic pain and acute pain are the same thing. Only one is longer in duration. True or false? False is right. <laughs> A little more hesitant there, but yeah, yep. false. Good job. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they're uh, both painful, but it's, um, am I right in saying it's a very different mechanism? It's a very different, acute pain is that need to protect yourself, need to, because of danger. Um, Chronic pain doesn't really serve us in a helpful, meaningful way. Um, the mm -hmm. only part of that statement, uh, yeah, they're, they're very, they're very different. The only, the the, the only thing there, the the there where people might get confused is the longer duration. Obviously, chronic pain is a longer duration, but it's not the same mechanism at all. Yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. the trick to remember that when you're in pain. That's tricky mm -hmm. to remember right. that. Yeah. Okay, so if pain is a harm alarm, as we're saying, that keeps on going, that keeps on ringing um, without further tissue damage, then the treatment or the approach is gonna be very different. So as rather than trying to um, repair or fix a broken arm or a broken leg, you're actually gonna have the situation of just learning to turn down the volume to turn down the dial of those pain receptors that are um, that should should have down regulated on their own. So, or it's like a smoke alarm that goes off just with the heat. Do you, if you ever have one of those, it keeps on going off, but there's no fire. It's only um, the heat from the stove. Or you have a dog such as this one that looks very much like my dog who will bark at everyone that walks by. Now you don't want them to not bark at all. You want them to bark at someone who's an intruder, 
but you don't need them to bark at every single person. So it's similar to chronic pain. You want your pain um, uh, alarm to, and it always, it always will be there for as long as we're surviving, but you don't need it to be going off all the time. All right, so I, threw, I just threw a couple of slides in here that you, have, you haven't seen before, but um, and this is from the work of Laura Mosley, who is coming on in July, July 19th, don't miss that webinar. And he talks about the protectometer. So if pain is this danger signal that's become overactive, the question now becomes not how do I treat my arm or my leg or my limb, but how can I reduce the danger signals, the danger inputs and increase the safety inputs in my body? And he called it a protectometer. So to, um, this is something that we've used in um, classes before. <clears throat> and it's just a simple little way of looking at on the left-hand side, we call them the DIMS, the danger in me. And the right-hand side is the safety in me or the SIMS. And to start noticing the things that are the danger signals, the things that cause you um, that signal of, of danger. And it could be anything, not just, it could be things you say, things you do, places you go, things you think, people, things happening in your body, all these things to start widening your scope and to also look at the things that create safety in you. So I want to just ask you this for a moment. Do you have an idea right now of things that for you give you a sense of calm, of safety, of turning down the stress response. Right now, can people just name a couple of things in the chat? Looking out at the water, looking out at the water, there's so much in that. Meditation, I'm seeing. Dogs, somebody always, always brings up pets and I agree with you. Um, Breathing. They've been used as therapy animals for a long time, right? For a reason. They sure have. They sure mm -hmm. have. Hiking, beading, beading. Yes. Uh, wonderful. It's almost like a meditation. Yeah. Um, yeah. As opposed to keeping a watch on triggers, because that's very tiring. You're right to the person that said that. Listening to music, watching baseball, CFL. So all these things, they might seem like they're, what? The Zen, Zen tangle. Somebody's going to have to tell me what that is. <laughs> it sounds like a puzzle. Um, laying on a heating pad, living doodle art. Yeah. Yeah. So these may seem like seemingly small things, but am I right in saying that when you're creating more of that sense of calm and safety in yourself, you're actually down-regulating your nervous system? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just want to say one other small thing at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Laura Mosley. So for people, most people won't know who Laura Mosley is because most people don't study chronic pain. But Laura Mosley is like, is, is like if we were running a high school computer class and you emailed Bill Gates and he said, oh, sure, come on, and I'll give you an in-person to your class. That's what Madeline has achieved here by getting Laura Mosley, who is from Australia, where a lot of work has been done in chronic pain. Um, the Australians have for years put a lot of time, effort and research into chronic pain. And, and Laura Mosley is, is probably one of the world experts on chronic yeah. pain. Like he is any, any pain clinic in the world. Uh, you know, a lot of their work is based on, on Laura Mosley's research. So this is, it's uh -huh. unbelievable that he just said, oh, yeah, sure, come on. So Do I sent out his TED talk the other day. So you guys have probably already got a, a little bit of a heads up um, mm -hmm. of who he is. So I'm going to send stuff out leading up, leading up to that because it is, it's one not to miss. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. so, so the thing um, is that everything connects. Yeah, it was a very good TED talk, Connie. I agree. I love that TED talk. Please go back and watch it, everyone. And then all this will make so much sense about Lorimer mm -hmm. Mosley's walk in the Australian yeah, back. back. Oh, with the brown snake, yeah. And, yeah. and again, you know, I, the other thing is it's taken, it's taken us as physicians a long time to understand this. Mm -hmm. We will probably run this 
class over and over because every time you 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 listen to it, you perhaps get a better understanding of what's going on. These are these yeah. are quite big concepts to come to terms with and to really kind of like resonate and and think about. So you know, if you don't get it all, that's okay. Um, you, you know, the more you think about it, the more time that you look at stuff like this and you get a better understanding because it, it, it's a journey, right? It, chronic pain is a journey for anybody in chronic pain. So um, I think what you're, what you're uh, under, probably getting by now is that everything connects to everything else. And I, I look mm. at it like a mobile. So if you, if you tug on the sleep, if you trigger the sleep, it affects everything else. Or if you, you know, do meditate or go look at the lake or pet your dog, like it does affect everything else. Everything is um, going to be related because your pain, uh, sometimes very unfortunately, uh, affects everything in your life. Am, am I right with that? It affects relationships, mm. it affects work, it affects um yeah. <clears throat> it affects your your activity your socializing and also everything in your life affects your pain mm -hmm. and it was neil pearson that first kind of opened my eyes to that to it's way beyond medications and and interventions which are part mm. of it but if you can start thinking about everything else in your life and uh, this by no means means because you know start shutting things down in your life but start moving towards the things that are helpful for you mm -hmm. absolutely yeah do you want to go through the mindset here um sure so you know this this goes back to that concept of a pain toolbox that we use right um because yeah. You know, there's that old saying, if, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's well, right. We, we, need, we need more than a hammer. Um, you know, drugs alone don't work. Interventions alone don't, don't work. I mean, there are specific times where, you know, obviously one intervention or some medication can bring about a big change. But generally speaking, um, there is a role for medication. There is a role for interventions or injections. There is a role for the neuroscience, the education, so people understand. Right. Um, because if, if any one of these interventions just worked on their own, we wouldn't be spending this amount of time devoted to chronic pain. We'd be like, oh, yeah, you just need this. It's easy. Well, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's all of these things. And some people might need more of one thing and less of another. That's where the individual component comes into this. It's not one size fits all, but these are the various tools that, that people need in different amounts in different, you know, different areas, right? For example, mm -hmm. if you have a significant sleep disturbance, um, we know that during REM sleep and, and, and proper sleep, that's when the body repairs itself. So if you're not sleeping properly, how on earth do you think your body's going to help deal with chronic pain? It's, it's not. That's why we have a whole talk devoted to sleep or, you know, if you're not, you know, if you if you're very anxious or you, you know, have a major a severe mood yeah. disorder, well, it's going to impact things. Right. Absolutely. So all those things are tools um, that you can use for um, um, to relearn pain to for Absolutely. your nervous system to relearn. Yeah. So we'll go back to some of those questions in a second, but I just wanted to run through some of these things for you to start thinking about, as believe it or not part of your pain management plan, okay? When we're talking about nervous system. So looking at your primary relationships, your support, your support or, or perhaps lack of support, you know, what's working, what's not. Looking at your, at your um, family or the people that are closest to you and, you know, what, what gives you energy, what drains you maybe work or financial stability, you know, these are other areas that um, are affected by pain and also affect pain. There we go with sleep. Don't we all wish we could have a nice sleep just like that? That little guy or girl there makes me just calm looking at him. 
<clears throat> movement, how we move. And these are also the other webinars that we offer as pain management. So I'm asked, I'm seeing questions, you know, around how do I improve my sleep? Um, that's another webinar that we have the recording for to absolutely don't settle for not knowing how to improve your sleep is what I'm saying. And that's what Chris says on the, on the sleep webinar. Make sure you do these things to improve your sleep. Moving safely, we do a webinar with, uh, with Neil Pearson. As movement can be a medicine for in so many ways for your body. Your rest, your relaxation, um, <clears throat> how do you find that in your life? This is one of the most important ones. It's a treatment, really. It's a, like a medication, medicine for pain management. Because remember, we're talking about the nervous system. Do you have time? Is there fun? Is there uh, some laughing or listening to music in your life? Those are, these are not small things when it comes to chronic pain. And of course, nutrition, our class with uh, Joelle Davidson is really worth um, looking at as well. Looking at what the inputs are. All of these are looking at what the inputs are into your body. Do you input a whole lot of stressful news or do you input something that feels good? Do you input good food? Do you inf input junk? So look at all those other things that are gonna help your pain situation. Your thoughts and emotions. Um, if that's an issue for you, like it is for most people with a mind, which includes all of us, uh, we do have our emotional freedom class that wraps up tomorrow night and that'll repeat again. This is a really important part of pain management. Um, so we'll get to the questions in a second. But just to summarize what we've been talking about here, and it may be kind of maybe new for some people, it might be repeat for others, but pain in is complex and it involves many factors beyond the physical. It's a program that the body has learned too well to, to uh, protect you. And like uh, Mark mentioned, neuroplasticity offers us much hope in healing. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that summary before we go to questions? No, uh, just I seem to have lost my screen, but that's okay. I'll just figure it out. I'm not, I'm not seeing the questions. Isn't that typical? That happens right at the end, hey? Oh. <laughs> that's okay. I'll just see. Okay. Okay. No big deal. Right. So we'll just go a few of the qu through a few of the questions. Um, and... Um, and uh, then we'll wrap up. So just a question, is it true that your body can be stuck in the fight, flight or freeze mode? And I will say that, yes, that is yep. very, very true. For sure. And it's probably true for most people. I, I want to venture to say a lot mm -hmm. of people are stuck in that high stress or in freeze. There's also something called the fibromyalgia freeze. And it's not mm -hmm. always related to that, but if you've had multiple stresses through your life, you can go into a freeze response, but that is still a very high stress uh, response, uh, high stress state to be in. So Absolutely. yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. So Mark, what type of pain is for arthritis? Um, oh, is it chronic well, or acute? So in the beginning, um, it's acute, like when it first develops, because there's often an inflammatory response, but with time it becomes chronic pain. And we know that some forms of arthritis actually also meet the criteria for central sensitization as well. Um, so there's a lot of crossover. Yeah, so arthri arthritic pain is usually uh, chronic pain. Um, mm. and, and again, there, there's a combination of, sometimes there is tissue damage actually happening because the joint's wearing out, but there's also the way your nervous system perceives that. Um, so that, that's, that's a harder one, but yeah, um, it does start off as, as acute because there's lots of, you know, tissue damage taking place, but it does mm -hmm. become chronic. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With hyperesthesia, can you lose the ability when you're grabbing things is that like the slip out of your fingers? Is that yeah, hyperesthesia? Hyperalgesia. Yeah. I answered that one. Yeah, I said, yes, it's possible. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I, I. 
I'm saying that. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Um, yeah. Okay. Neuroplasticity. Can you, do you want to take a, a, a job at uh, explaining neuroplasticity? Um, so in neuroplasticity, we know that um, the endogenous down-regulating system in your brain, how you can enhance or recruit that um, because the brain is able to change in a positive way, but it needs some help. So um, through various techniques, needs, whether it's breathing, relaxation, mindfulness-based therapy, uh, exercise, sleep, nutrition, you can develop healthier neural pathways. Mm -hmm. Can you still hear me? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Because yeah. my, my picture now disappeared too, but that's okay. Oh, oh hopefully right. other people can, I can see you, I can see me. Um, yeah, so those we we only had this discovery of neuroplasticity in the last couple of decades that your brain is not ever fully um, fully formed and that's it. We used to think that you couldn't learn after a certain age, and now we know that the brain continues to change throughout your whole lifespan, depending on your experiences. So um, there is probably really that book, The Brain That Changes Itself, that mm. came out um, that right. showed that you can create new neural pathways at any time in your life. And, and that is the hopeful thing for chronic pain. And any expert that I've ever um, interviewed has left us with the thought that with the, the hope that there is reasonable hope for healing. There's reasonable hope for healing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so just another question here. It's, it's a bit of a longer one. Um, oh, okay. Just trouble with focus when with fibromyalgia. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a, yeah, it is a question that comes up around the kind of fogginess and, and mm -hmm. focus for like, for example, when you're in um, a conversation. Right. So that, that is often part of the central sensitization, uh, the poor concentration, um, you know, inability to focus. Um, it's definitely part of mm -hmm. that brain central sensitization. Um, and one that's often one of the, the, the features of fibromyalgia um, in some people is, is, is that, you know, poor concentration as well. It, 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 it's not mm -hmm. uncommon. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there are all of these tools that we are talking about, including the breathing, the meditation, with, especially with fibromyalgia, the nutrition, all those uh, uh, and slow graduated movement again, slow graduated movement and gentle um, also helps with, uh, with fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So, okay, so this is a good question. I and mean, I know it's come up before, but, but the numbing, uh, freezing the nerve, like with the injections that you do, Mm -hmm. Do those do those injections actually change the brain patterns? I I think they can interrupt the peripheral input. Um, so again, it's a tool, and we sometimes use those in patients with, for example, chronic back or neck pain. We, we would freeze the nerve, which might temporarily stop it conducting a pain signal, and then sometimes we can actually cauterize that nerve, but we have to be very careful and pick the nerves appropriately because some nerves don't really like that. And then they, they give you more pain than, than you started off with. But uh, lots, lots of times in the neck and the, and the back, when we, when we do those procedures, they can be quite helpful. So they can be a, a tool in disrupting that, that mm -hmm. input, you know, the sensory input that your brain is already thinking is, is more ramped up than it should mm -hmm. be. Okay, yeah. And my understanding also on that note is that when you um, have injections, then, then it allows you, if they work, if they help, 
It allows you to move a little more, mm -hmm. to sleep a little more, to eat right. a little better. So all of those ways at the same time are changing those brain patterns. Right, exactly. You know, yeah. like just like an antidepressant might just get and be enough to get you out walking, which then mm -hmm. helps depression. Like, absolutely. So it adds, it's like kind of, it all adds up. Exactly. Uh, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I, I hope this all this information has been helpful. And um, I guess what I want to encourage everybody to do is if you see something here, or in one of the webinars that you think might help you, or if it's an area in your life that you you feel like it could use a little bit of a tweak, don't hesitate, don't wait to do it. Start doing it because it's as it's like a mobile, everything affects everything else so if you need to get to bed earlier and have a better a better sleep schedule then please do that don't don't wait a, another day to do it because everything is seems to either help or hinder pain and this is far beyond um as you're getting the the, the message far beyond um, just medications and interventions because we are whole people. We're not just we're not just limbs and bodies. We're we're minds. We're we're bodies. We're spirits. Absolutely. We are emotions. We have relationships. Um, all of these things in our lives are affecting our central nervous systems right now. So. Problem. Okay. So why don't we just end with uh, that's a lot of information. Just a, a couple, maybe just two, maybe just two deep breaths that we can do together before we move on with the rest of our evenings. Just to just take a two breaths on your own and just allow whatever information needs to settle in. But just let it settle in, let it digest for a while, and then you know you might find tomorrow or even later tonight that something comes up for you that you move towards that um, just helps you a little bit more to regulate uh, your own nervous system and perhaps just turn down the volume, turn down the dial of your pain just a bit. So, all right. I don't see any other questions. So again, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Oh, sure, absolutely. Session and no um, problem. and uh, hopefully you'll be here next next week. We have a um, an expert in trauma and chronic pain. He's also from Australia. I've searched the whole world for you guys for the experts in these areas. And tomorrow we have Mark Grant coming. Uh, tomorrow next week from Australia. He's, it's going to be really helpful and very practical. Then we have Mary Ellen talking about the many losses that come with and how to manage that with pain. Um, and then we've got uh, two other speakers, Dr. Darnell, who created Empowered Relief. She created the program out of Stanford. She's going to come and talk to us. And then the very last Monday, we have Dr. Howard Schubiner coming on and I'll be sending you info information leading up to his talk because um, he's got some really interesting stuff too. So great. All right, everyone, have a good night. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next Monday. Okay, thanks. All right, I'll just, I'll just stick around. Um, people do, oh, okay. Sorry, Stuart, I thought you were asking how to sign, how to sign up, yes. Do sign up for this. Do sign up for this stuff because um, there's some real, real evidence that we, it's that there's some reasonable hope for healing in chronic pain. All right. Good night, everyone. <laughs>